We're doing part two of three. We're gonna cover primarily the fiscal year 2021 accidents. And this is something that we tend to do every year through the New England FAST team. What we are gonna focus on in about up to 90 minutes, we'll cut it off there, is on the pure gliders. Now, a couple things just to review is a little bit of a disclaimer is the whole concept of this is to provide some discussion material uh, within your clubs and specifically for the flight instructors out there to think about what are the things that end up causing us accidents in the gliding world and what we can do to help our students learn to avoid them. You know, we don't try to speculate we do try to provide additional information. That's one of the benefits of being a FAST team program manager is I can take both the NTSB and the FAA data, maybe give you a little bit more insight than you might just find out there. But just about everything that you're gonna see here about tonight is going to be out there available, uh, public information. And we try to keep it as accurate as we can, but you know, classically, not all these accidents Things are done, people make errors, all of the various reasons. So, you know, something may not be accurate, but our intention is to keep it as accurate as possible. A quick little thing, I covered this last time, cover it here quick. We got people from all over the country and the world. We had 550 pre-registered about three or four days before part one, that was a week and a half ago. Now we got about 676 pre-registered Right now, tonight so far, we're looking at 310 plus of you online. We had about 375 plus the last time. But these are the areas where all of you are coming from. And I was impressed the last time with the number of clubs. I was vastly surprised. That's about twice as many glider clubs out there than I expected <laughs> to have joining us. So that's terrific. This is a poll question from last year where we had asked the attendees, about 375 of them, if they knew someone that was involved in a glider or a tow plane accident. Uh, surprise, not necessarily a pleasant surprise, but two thirds of you did, uh, two thirds of the attendees last year. And as I mentioned last time, we wanna get that swapped around. This I do look at as being supplemental to what the Soaring Safety Foundation does. It is um, to try to provide some detail on the accidents themselves for the great work that the Soaring Safety Foundation does every year, putting together a comprehensive overview of what has happened within the um, glider soaring world with it. So that usually comes out in their April edition. Um, it is terrific on their website. They also have the report. I went and looked there earlier uh, or at the end of last week. Still wasn't up, but it will be soon. I do know that. And I wanna emphasize here, last time in part one of this, we look at the stats and data. You know, really, really would help if the clubs would participate in the launch and flight time database that the Soaring Society of America and Soaring Safety Foundation is doing out there. So like I said, that is, this is intended for the instructors out there. And just to give you a quick overview, a little slight rehash of what we covered last week, we're gonna cover the 19 pure glider accidents uh, now. There were two motor glider accidents. They ended up being the last two within the fiscal year. And depending upon how you look at it, there's one, two, or three tow plane accidents. So there's one that definitively, exclusively is associated with sailplane towing. And that one we're going to cover, but there's two others that I think are of interest. One the NTSB says was glider towing, although it was really hang glider towing. And then another one that uh, doesn't show up on the record that way, but we do know it was someone that was training towards being a tow pilot in uh, what happened there. So just a quick review, like I said, past 10 years of the accidents, last year and this year, we're actually standing at 21 each. Uh, the reason why, there's still one listed as a motor glider from fiscal year 2020. And in fiscal year 2021, one of the accidents was a collision with two gliders. And those were put under one single report, although it was two separate aircraft involved. And as I mentioned, that occurred, that occurred in November. So it'll be one of the first ones we take a look at. 
That was November of 2020. And then our tow plane type accidents happened in June and July. This is where it was. This is always the big interest to people is where they happen. And uh, Massachusetts had a rough year. In fact, uh, one particular club had a rough year um, with it for various reasons. And we'll look at some of that here. But these are the states where glider accidents happened in fiscal year 2021. If you see that little bar of the state initials over on the edge, that's where the pilots were domiciled, where they lived. Uh, you'll notice pretty much they equal close to one-to-one, -to -one, but not exactly. The FAA does look at accidents too. And like I said, we're going through this quick, but here's when the FAA looked at their accidents, they most everything was associated with pilot-induced error. That's common across the board at all aircraft, but very, very prominent in glider related. And then probably more importantly to the instructors out there is thinking about this in terms of the contributing factors to the accident. This could be anywhere from zero contributing factors to as many as 10 plus or whatever the investigating inspector decides. But here's what they had associated with the accidents for fiscal year 2021. You'll notice stall, spin, not necessarily stall then spin, but stall and or spin um, is the most prominent. Hard landings are up there. We'll see a few of those. Loss of control of the aircraft, hitting known object, another one with it. And then also, this is something you don't see in the NTSB data, but what's known as the FAA areas of responsibility is when an FAA person does an accident investigation, they're also tasked with looking to see if there's anything that is under the purview of the FAA and has an impact on it. And, you know, we see things like a couple FAR violations, believe it or not, airman medical qualifications, even though a medical is not required, as a glider pilot, you're still required under 6153 to you know, be safe and competent and medically competent to act as pilot in command. And there was one accident where the FAA inspector felt that was not the case. Airworthiness plays a role and airman competency also plays a role. I will specifically note at least one case under the airman competency is not oriented towards the pilot in the accident. It's oriented towards the AMP mechanic that was involved in doing maintenance or inspections on the aircraft in this past year. And we will probably see that come up. Usually, but not always, airman competency being marked here relates to what's known as a 44709, also known as a re-exam uh, for it. And that does end up happening some. Thankfully, FAA, kinder, gentler, whatever you wanna say about it, but with uh, the compliance program, compliance philosophy, we have had more opportunity lately as compared to years past to do things like remedial training, and get people to work with DPEs and safety reps out there. I know, John Wood, you and I have worked together for years. Geez, I, I remember even 10 years ago, that was almost impossible to get <laughs> remedial training for someone after an accident. But I think we can do it a lot more now. Is that not correct? Yeah, that is, Steve. I mean, it's, it's wonderful to see uh, the FAA really adopt that philosophy with the new compliance philosophy that um, you know most mistakes are unintentional. And uh, most incidents and accidents are unintentional. We can get out there with training and help bring pilots back up to a state of proficiency and knowledge where they need to be. And that is great. I'm uh, happy to see that definitely come about. It really has made a difference in our time. And then for the next thing, let's see. I'll try clicking one more time because it decided to stop on me. There we go. <laughs> I got it going now. And if you are curious, I did just earlier today get last week's presentation loaded up, which is on primarily stats and statistics associated with soaring, kind of the state of the sport in the activity with it. So there's the links there. 
to it. You can go right to the uh, Boston Fast Team YouTube channel. You can find it. It's the latest uploaded video. The second item down there is a direct link to it. So if you want to capture a quick screenshot of that, go right ahead. Can I give you the count of, you know, three, two, one, and let's move into fiscal year 2021. Maybe a little bit different from the Soaring Safety Foundation that goes by calendar year. And boy, I, I would like to do that generally myself, but guess what? Here within the FAA, we all work on a fiscal year and all of our data that we can pull is almost always oriented towards that. So it'd be a tremendous, tremendous amount more work for myself and other FPMs and safety reps to get out the information by calendar year. So we kind of focus in on the fiscal year. And we had 19 pure glider accidents. Um, a few things just so that you know in relation to it. Um, eight of them were instructional. One of them was in a competition. However, I did talk a little bit about um, unfound or unreported accidents that we had in fiscal year 2021 in the last program. I basically already knew this, but it has been confirmed that two of those four uh, did occur at a competition in addition to the one that we'll take a look at. We had two aircraft involved in a midair. One of them was maintenance, three off airport. Also three of the instructional out of the eight were off airport. We had one that was landing short, hitting an obstacle, but that was also the case with two off airports. And we had three um, associated with tow and launch. Uh, one of those, or excuse me, one of those was associated with the competition. Another one was associated with instruction. So let's look at the first one that shows up in the NTSB database for fiscal year 2021, which started October 1st, 2020. And right here, before the first week was out, we had this one happen, which was a part 91 personal. I do note with the asterisk, it was instructional, uh, kind of by what the FAA would deem. It was a solo student and it was a landing undershoot. Solo student, as I mentioned, age 69, flight review unknown, but we would suspect that they were endorsed in the last day or two based upon the other information available because they had just been soloing. 29 hours total, 11 in the last 90 days, uh, one solo, which had all been in the last 24. What is interesting with this one, which makes it a little bit harder, and the NTSB does not always have to, but they did not release a docket at least yet, which has the pictures and more details on it. So all you have is just what's in the final report. And also, this is really interesting. Uh, this is the one accident where, although I know it was reported within our FAA system, I could not find any FAA records associated with it. Um, as our FPMs and safety reps that are out there and maybe even some of the DPEs. We have a system within the FAA called ATQA that accidents and incidents are reported in and stuff like that had nothing there. So we know the NTSB was not on scene. Actually don't even know if the FAA did. It may have just been one of those investigations that was done from the desk. Some notes from the final report is during the final approach, instead of closing the air brakes, the student opened them further, realizing the mistake, closed them, lost altitude, hit hard short of the runway, and the NTSB's probable cause. Students' pilots' improper application of the air brakes during final approach, which resulted in landing area undershoot and hard bounced landing. So a few things that pop in my mind about this for takeaways for the instructors is, you know, solo is a stressful time for a lot of students. And you do end up seeing kind of the uh, tunnel vision associated with it. And how do you catch their attention? You know, I've seen many circumstances where, you know, due to stressful situations, people coming into land, 
and have the dive brakes open are getting lower and lower and lower and going to end up short, but they still have the dive brakes out. And one thing that I found that works is just right on the radio is, you know, saying loudly dive brakes or something similar to that. And amazingly, it is the jolt that they close up. Uh, you know, I now at this point in time, I can attest to at least four times that I know people would have ended up landing short of the runway if I had not said something. So, you know, when I'm walking around doing ground ops, I'm always carrying a handheld radio right on the side of my pocket and try to use it for that sort of thing. I've also used it before on takeoff <laughs> is watched a uh, tow plane and glider start to take off with the dive brakes still out and don't want to prejudge it or say too much, but usually just the word dive brakes is enough of a jolt to get them to close the dive brakes and not, you know, release at an inappropriate time. You know, some of the instructors out there, Bill, Daryl, you, you've seen that with the dive brakes on students? Uh, usually with this, yeah, and it, it'll come up in the next uh, one of your accidents. But uh, yeah, if I've seen low approaches out there, then I usually key the radio real quick. I hate instructing from the ground, but sometimes you have to. True point, true point. Second one was a more prominent accident. This was the mid-air collision that we had that occurred out in Clayton, California back in early November. Um, was between an ASW-20C and an ASW-27. Uh, the 20C is actually out for bid um, from the insurance company right now. Is It is marked on the NTSB report as both pilots having serious injuries. Um, and it is also marked that way on the FAA report, which I'll mention here in a second. However, hearing from people involved in this is I have been told, and it kind of fits other descriptions that I've found digging into the material, is that one pilot had minor injuries, the other pilot did have serious injuries. Uh, the FAA was on scene on this one, however, the NTSB was not, and it was a mid-air collision. This is a picture from the local press, and if you do take a look at it, I'll highlight it here by the arrows, is, if I recall correctly, they're a little hard to see, but the dark spots, one of them, the top one is clearly a glider up here, and I'll get out my highlighter. Top one up here is clearly a glider. The second one down below is clearly an open parachute, and it is not the pic best picture, and I have blown it up as best as I can. That one, to me, also appears to be another glider, but other people may know better than I do. So pilot information on 18 Mike, Mike Alpha, private pilot, age 71, flight review nine months prior. Um, looks like actually both pilots had flight reviews at the start of the season on the same weekend at the club. The pilots did know each other and flew in the same area. It is report, and this is where we end up with some of the interesting stuff, um, 1,850 hours total, 186 hours in make and model. We look at the pilot in Kilo Papa, uh, reported by the FAA as commercial flight instructor. Um, but what we do find is that there are numerous typos or mix-ups in the reports, both within the NTSB and the FAA, is for this pilot, the NTSB says only had a private pilot um, certificate, but researching the data shows has commercial CFI. The NTSB also um, had said that they both have 186 hours in the make and model, but that's not the same. Also in the FAA report, the time and type is listed as identical. Uh, for both pilots. What happened is while following lift under cumulus clouds, one pilot reported observing another, uh, the ASW going from basically right to left as 
seen by the ASW-27 pilot and the ASW-27 pilot mentioned an aircraft suddenly appearing to his left. That was followed by a collision. What is good is both aircraft were equipped with FLARM. And however, prior to the collision, the ASW-20 pilot did not receive any alerts or additional. The ASW-27 pilot said the glider was equipped, but it was inoperative because FLARM requires an annual software update to even use the traffic collision. And that's something that'll come back here. This is interesting. It is It is always great when people put this in the reports, is the pilot statements. I think this was from the ASW-27 pilot statement, is his first recommendation to avoid accidents like this in the future is that, you know, not disabling the device's collision avoidance just because the latest software is not installed. The pilot had reported trying to update it several times and also had made arrangements at a glider maintenance facility to have them work on it uh, in the future. And also because this was the pilot, one pilot got caught in the trees and ended up stopping just before hitting the ground. The other pilot hit the ground and hit it pretty hard, which is a major factor in the serious injuries. But his recommendation was also to recommend getting a larger chute than indicated by your weight to soften the blow. As I mentioned, the other pilot was lucky. His chute got caught in the trees and he ended up just hanging above the ground with no major impact. So here are the pictures uh, from it. The tail boom here on the uh, 27 is believed to have been broken when it hit the trees or hit the ground. That was actually not believed to be part of the collision, but both aircraft basically appear to have hit and it's hard to say exactly, but left wing to left wing, maybe maybe something similar to this, as you can tell by the impact marks. So this is where it appears the wing, left wing of the ASW-27 came into contact with the ASW-20. The ASW-20 ended up in the trees. And if you look at the yellow circle there, you can see the impact damage. NTSB probable cause, which is not a giant surprise uh, to us, is the failure of both pilots in, to see and avoid one another while maneuvering resulted in a midair collision. Uh, you know, this is always interesting. I know some folks out in that area have done um, some safety oriented programs towards this about how hard see and avoid is what the benefits you may have from collision avoidance systems and all of that. And I, I will also point out, this is one of those terrific things from doing a program like this is um, one of the pilots has provided me with the IGC files on this, and I'm hoping to use those in something future to learn a little bit about the challenges of C and avoid. So, Hopefully this is one of those that was a challenging accident for the community that will have positive lasting benefits. A couple of the takeaways were already mentioned. What also was mentioned is practicing bailout procedures, um, how to do it in your particular aircraft, what is involved. The pilots here mentioned that because the aircraft rolled inverted or flipped inverted after the collision, that it was easier for them to get out, um, which really helped out. But it's also important to recognize what the steps are going to be in your process and recognize you don't have much time. Doesn't happen often, but when it does, you want to be prepared, right? And Daryl, I'm going <laughs> to jump towards you only because I know I don't know if you keep it up, but you have at least been qualified as a parachute rigger, if not more in the past. Uh, you know, this is probably a good thing, not only within the IEC community, but the glider community to maybe have somebody come out and talk about 
the emergency chutes, packing procedure, how to use them? Yeah, sure, Steve. Um, um, I, I still pack a lot of parachutes for the glider yeah. community and the aerobatic community. And um, the aerobatic community is, um, they're all about practicing their bailout procedure each time they get out of the aircraft, uh, almost religiously. Um, you talk to the glider pilots about it. And uh, usually the answer I get is, well, I'm really not gonna use the parachute anyway. I just need to get it packed to be legal, that's all. <laughs> um, and many um, really don't quite understand how to fit the parachute properly. Yeah. Um, I, I think the bailout practice uh, definitely paid off for these folks. Um, the gentleman who said he wished he had a, a bigger parachute so when he hit the ground it didn't hit so hard is, well, you're going to hit hard anyway. Um, and a lot of the pilots I pack parachutes for, especially in the glider community again, um, they're, they're overweight for the parachute they have and they're claiming, well, the bigger ones don't fit in, in my glider. And I always offer up the two or three demo parachutes that I have for them to try one out and see how it fits. Um, but they tend to be content with theirs. So um, the other takeaway here um, that I saw going back to the, the training part is um, we should all be making, um, looking before you turn um, and basically an instinct each time we turn. Uh, if I'm doing training in, in any aircraft and uh, the True. student turns and they don't look, I grab the stick or the wheel. And I, I turn it right back and go, what did we forget? And I make them look each time. And, uh, and frankly, I'm looking all the time, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I understand that. And, you know, that is a terrific takeaway because I do know, at least in the initial certification um, check rides, that really has to be harped upon with a lot of students. And then even, you know, professional pilots because they've been in a controlled environment so much that when they get back out there visually, they really need to. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if we have an answer to this. I threw on there collision avoidance detection is still an issue. I think we noticed that last week, if we look at the um, NASA reports, with the percentage of near mid-air collision reports and then some of the other stuff that I shared. Transponder debate is ongoing and is probably more focused towards the ADSB side of it, uh, but it's going there. FLARM has been a terrific tool. Some countries use it above and beyond the glider community, which has been terrific. Uh, I've even talked about, and I know they are giving some consideration to it at the Washington level with 800, but I have been an advocate for what are known as tab devices like um, the Sky Echo, um, or even it came up today with one of our maintenance FPMs um, transponders. But the difference here in the United States, one company has a TT22 um, transponder that meets the requirements within the US and then has a TT21 that does it. Uh, but battery wise, it, the TT21 would work probably much better in the glider community. So I don't have a solution to that. I wish I did. <laughs> uh, but I think it is something that all of those points associated with collision avoidance and especially, you know, looking outside are something that we have to be thinking about as instructors. Yeah, one more takeaway on that, yep. Steve, is um, maybe pilots are spending too much time on their collision avoidance system. And um, instead of looking before they turn, they're looking at the screen before they turn. Um, and, you know, we all get distracted as pilots by technology in the cockpit. And to maybe just draw attention to that and make sure that uh, if you are maneuvering in tight places, uh, you're looking outside, which is probably just as good as looking at your farm screen. Yeah, it's 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 look, look, look. Um, I always harp on my students before they move the stick left or right for a turn is, you know, look like look left, clear left, turn left or look right, clear right, turn right. And I when they when they're flying and I'm behind them, I, I say it out loud. 
to just get that mantra into their head. Um, I've also beat up students, you know, that uh, they're always straying straight ahead. They've never looked over their shoulder, even if they're just flying straight and level. Terrific. All right, let's move on to the next one. Thank you there, Phil. Is next one occurred just after or uh, right in the middle of the holidays. It is a final report that's out there. Part 91 personal uh, was Libel 205. Injuries were serious, definitely. Um, within the FAA, got to see more pictures than you'll see on the NTSB. And, you know, this was one of those very hard accidents. The FAA was there on scene, uh, but not the NTSB. It was a collision as the NTSB labeled on takeoff or landing. It actually was an off airport landing um, that the pilot struck some objects uh, and ended up basically stalling, hitting the ground hard. It is, had gotten private pilot just about a year before it appears in January, 2020, age 68. Flight review was the check ride just the, uh, appears just 11 months earlier, 45 hours total time, had one hour in the make and model. It was their second flight. This was kind of a club higher performance glider. And it was this person's second flight in it. What the pilot stated, kept the airport in sight for most of the flight. However, at an altitude of 1500 feet AGL lost sight and was unable to locate it. So kind of getting lost in the practice area. An altitude of 1100, he decided to look for a suitable field in which to make a uh, landing off airport, which is excellent. Witness stated he watched the glider descend towards the field, clipped a tree and collided nose first. Um, I'm just trying to take a look at my notes here a little bit. What was noted by some of the pictures, because pictures were being taken even before the uh, aircraft had clipped a tree, but witness seemed like it seemed like the pilot was changing fields at the last minute, caught the wing on the trees at the edge of the field being low. This is one of those that it, it is hard, but if had enough energy and had just landed a little bit further down the field, you know, classically, it, the pilot may have felt a little bit embarrassed about it, but it would have had a much more positive outcome uh, with this. This is what the glider looked like after impact uh, with it hit very hard on the nose. Uh, you'd see some of the divots associated with it. Probable cause by the NTSB, pilot's failure to maintain adequate clearance from trees during off airport. Few things to think about here, and this is where, you know, we as instructors gotta be thinking is low time and type, what is, associated with that. Also something we always deal about is the flat approach. And we really start to have, have to ask ourselves, why is this such a common theme in what we have uh, in our accidents? It, it really is something that we see over and over and over again, is people coming in very low, very flat, uh, ends up cutting things. Most of our gliders, I won't say all of them, uh, but even those that were not the best uh, fiberglass ones with dive brakes have had improvements like the Cirrus has the modification for the uh, two blades on it and stuff is full dive brakes are going to be more than you need almost always. So we really shouldn't be working on setting ourselves up for those low flat approaches because we do end up having people hurt ending up short of the runway much more than we have them ending up hurt long of the runway and then outlanding you know granted it is something with a lack of experience and we need to think about how do you train that and you know some of the things i'm a big big advocate for any club doing what i would call an excursion but occasionally going off to visit other clubs and other airports and to see what is involved with that, to learn about different airports, different conditions, that sort of thing. I also kind of wonder if maybe, you know, as more and more places are starting to use uh, simulator, 
if that is something that might be able to be used. The next accident was in Groveland, Florida in March. Uh, it is still preliminary right now. Uh, part 91 personal, this did occur at the seniors competition uh, made for a rough year there. Uh, Mini Nimbus C16 Mike Golf, uh, non-fatal, serious injuries to the pilot in the aircraft. FAA was on scene. The pilot had an ATP uh, commercial level glider age 60. This, the asterisks indicate this is I'm getting from FAA data. The flight review is unknown, but I would distinctly say likely less than six months because I do know that this pilot uh, operated as a professional ATP pilot, and that's where the 14,600 plus hours um, total time came from. Hours in make and model unknown. This one probably was hard to the community as a whole, because those that do know the pilot do know that he was very, a very active and instrumental person, both in the um, Soaring Safety Foundation and also in the IAC clubs, a uh, strong advocate for general aviation. And it really hurts when, you know, someone that is a strong advocate like that is in this position of having to deal with the accident and the ramifications of it. So it was under arrow tow off of runway 18 at Seminole Lake when the left wing dipped and struck the ground. The glider began to swerve to the left. Pilot released from the tow plane, uh, right thing to be doing, which is awesome. But the glider departed the left side of the turf runway, crossed over a paved road and impacted an unoccupied pick, park pickup truck. In, from what I've heard is kind of the cockpit area went underneath the pickup truck uh, between the front and the main wheel. Don't know 100% on that, but that's what I had heard. According to FAA data, about 500 feet from the north end of the runway and about 150 feet left of the center line. I'm not sure because I was not there, nor have I looked at anything that diagrammed it, but what I have seen is I'm making the assumption, and uh, I'll emphasize there, is the pickup truck was most likely in the area that's highlighted by the yellow circle here. There's probably people that were in attendance, maybe even witnesses to this, that can pinpoint that further than I can. But from what information I've gathered and knowing and having flown at that airport, I believe that's what it sounds like it was. And some of the takeaways just you know, as we do is aborted launch, you know, is it something that you practice? Do you, do you not? Why? I will emphasize it is definitely a high risk endeavor, especially if you're doing an aborted launch where the tow plane is also aborting. You can go back in the past years. I know we had one that still to this day, John Wood and I look at it and just say how lucky the glider pilot was that he was not uh, chopped up by the propeller uh, at a collision here in Vermont with an aborted takeoff of a tow plane and glider. But knowing the process and the procedures, it may be something to think about. And also it happens in our regular flying, in our regular training. It goes right so many times. It's a little hard to prepare or think about or be triggered for that circumstance where it's gonna go wrong. And this is something maybe to think about or discuss with your students. Do you have objects near the runway that could end up being in an aborted takeoff, similar to what we'll see here when the final comes out, could end up colliding with? I know one of the accidents we had in the Midwest last year was a glider on a takeoff roll colliding with a parked 233. And that's probably, that wasn't the first, nor is it probably the last time that we'll see this. Another thing that this catches my attention on is just crew coordination on the launch. You know, do you say anything uh, with it? What is terrific is usually the competitions have, you know, the younger, more sprite, no gray hair wing runners out there 
uh, that do a terrific job of running and even sprinting with the wings uh, with it. But we probably also have seen, you know, accidents, whether it's on YouTube or other videos where the uh, wing runner just kind of goes eh, with, with the wing. And, you know, that can be a big, big issue if you're launching with a tailwind or especially like in a competition, you're carrying a lot of ballast. And that's something I, I think we need to discuss and think about sometimes is the capabilities of a wing runner. I have a little bit older glider myself, maybe not quite as effective ailerons as something you might find that's newer uh, in its capabilities. And every now and then, you know, you end up in those almost calm wind days. And that's when I end up usually saying to the wing runner, hey, I need you to put in a little extra effort if you don't mind with me on this one, just because I'm not gonna get the aileron effectiveness until we get up to speed, you know? just losing some of that and to think about it probably even more so if you're landing with a tailwind anything else to add folks let me go back all right in may we had this accident in hampshire illinois so this is interesting just because it's is associated with a launch and a return to the airport. The NTSB listed as miscellaneous or other uh, was serious injuries for the student that was in the front of the aircraft, uh, minor injuries for the person in the back. But we don't have much winch launching that occurs here in the United States. So if you're doing that type of operation, this should be one that you pay particular attention to. Uh, Pilot and command commercial CFI also had for airplane student non-certificated ages 65 and 59 flight review for the flight instructor was just nine months prior 760 hours total had 20 hours in the make and model weather doesn't appear to be a factor at all and that's the case in almost all of the accidents weather really doesn't play a huge factor in most of them reported the glider accelerator the 70 knots, uh, which exceeded the winch launch speed. The instructor attempted to decrease the speed. The weak link, safety link broke and the glider separated at about 600 feet AGL, according to the report. And flight instructor attempted to maneuver the glider back to the runway. The glider's critical angle attack seated in an aerodynamic stall and was reported within the docket is tried to climb over the tree, but lost energy and impacted the high branches then pitched down in a vertical attitude. And within the docket is this hand-drawn diagram uh, or hand annotated diagram, let me phrase it that way, uh, associated with a launch, returning back and then striking the trees in this area. Let's see. Oh, reacting a little slow to me. This is what the impact made the aircraft look like after the fact. And the NTSB was the flight instructor's failure to maintain aircraft control resulting in the critical angle of attack uh, following that, which re resulted in aerodynamic stall and spin and subsequent impact with trees. Yeah, as I said, this may be interesting accident to pay attention to, uh, maybe even learn some things from as winch operations become more popular with it. The comfort level uh, for the CFI, you know, I have got my winch launch endorsement. And as I describe what it tells me <laughs> for my personal comfort level is I need to do it a lot more with an instructor before I'm ever going to feel comfortable doing it on my own, in my own glider, and also correspondingly reaching a level of proficiency that I would feel comfortable as an instructor. What will that take? It's hard to say, but it is definitely, you know, something that I learned in just getting the endorsement is this is something that is intense and has, you know, not as much margin probably for errors or something going wrong. 
And it is important too, although it's not discussed within this accident at all, but it is something if you are an entity club that's looking at it, is to think about it for the training in the training for the winch operator also. The regulatory requirements for the um, operator, what's required there and what it's going to be in order to be insurance related. I did pass over it. Um, uh, sorry about that in my prior notes too. There, within the investigation, you will find a fair amount of what I would call discussion about the weak link that was used. However, in all of that discussion, it appears that the result that the NTSB came up with is that it really was not that big of a factor. Um, compared to some documentation, it appears the weak link may have been just one step stronger, not weaker, but stronger than what was recommended. And as a result, um, there was attention paid to that in the initial part of the investigation, but it doesn't appear that it had any bearing on it as it approached the final. Steve, what, what was the uh, altitude of the glider when it lost uh, or when the, the line broke? Did you say 600 feet? As, as reported, yes. Um, you have it here is what was listed in it was at about 600 feet AGL. So on a, a ground launch like that, about 600 feet AGL, that's when you're going to start your more aggressive climb. And at 600 feet AGL, um, you know, I know it wasn't there, but just looking at the drawing you had there, the, the proper thing might have been to just continue straight ahead. And I'm assuming the, the winch was where that little red dot is out there, right? I, I actually don't know the answer to that. Okay. This is a PDF document or from a PDF document in the docket itself. Yeah. That this is the image and you can tell that there's the red circle and a comment box on it, but within that document, you can't open up that comment box or anything. Yeah. So okay. I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, it, it also looks, and I was going to say this about a couple of the other uh, accidents we've talked about, that landing out accidents. Um, a lot of pilots think they need to get back to the airport because that's where the glider belongs. And uh, landing out is nothing to be ashamed of. Uh, you may hurt the glider a little bit, but you're not going to, you're not going to lose your life over it either. Um, whenever I'm flying, um, whether it be a takeoff and a glider, a hot air balloon or an airplane, I'm always looking at what's my primary place I'm going to go to if I have an engine failure or a problem and what's plan B and what's plan C and maybe I need a plan D. Um, but uh, I'm always going to take the uh, route that's going to make me survive the, the situation the most, whether it be in a hay field or in a plowed field of uh, crops. Yeah, that's one of the things I think that we are all learning from. And, and that's why I do emphasize, you'll see it again and again and again here today for clubs to do excursions. Basically, a way I describe it is instead of just being, you know, a glider pilot at XYZ airport, you want to become a sailplane pilot capable of operating anywhere. And whether that be excursions with a club that maybe have the opportunity to try a different airport once a year or whatever, and to go with that, or, you know, the classic on vacations, you know, you fly in Indiana in the middle of winter, why not take a vacation to Arizona or Southern California uh, to learn a little bit, and learn a little about flying in the mountains and the differences in the fields. You know, you, you take a look, I know in Arizona, from pictures aloft, 1, 1,500 feet up, you're like, hey, this doesn't look too bad. And then you get down there on the surface and you find, you know, um, boulders bigger than old 1980s monitors mm -hmm. everywhere. You're like, oh, maybe that isn't really where I want to be putting a glider down, you know, and learning about all those different areas. You know, Bill, I... You fly here in New England yet again, but you were flying out west in the Las Vegas area. I mean, 
both kind of mountainous, but boy, I'm sure big differences. Yes, the biggest problems we had were when uh, we had visitors from the East Coast that were looking at stuff at the ground on, from the air that said, yeah, I can land down there. And I says, yeah, you land down there, but you're, you might break something and uh, the airplane will be totaled. Yeah. Yeah, if it's not a runway or a dry lake or someplace that you've actually had your sneaker treads on, you don't want to land there. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it definitely is good to get different experiences around the country if you have the capabilities. Next one was uh, one of the first ones we had here in Massachusetts, um, Sterling, Massachusetts. It's still preliminary, uh, personal, Pilatus BC4. Uh, injuries listed as none. Uh, I do know the pilot and um, the circumstances, I think, had a couple bumps, bruises, scrapes. So I would say minor in the eyes of the FAA. The FAA did go visit on scene. Private pilot, glider, airplane, age 62. Again, this is from FAA data, as you can tell by the asterisks. Flight review was just about one month prior, had 250 hours total, only had two hours in the make and model. So it was a fairly new pilot to this airframe. Oop. My computer's going a little slow. And Bill, correct me if I'm wrong, because I don't have uh, the exactness to this is what the pilot had done uh, ended up a bit low and ended up clipping trees trying to land short in this area, if I recall correctly, and ended up clipping the trees right at the edge of the runway in this yellow circle about where I have the red mark. Uh, yeah, you're, you're pretty right. Uh, you can see that curve that leads into the paved runway just forward of that where the tan is. Uh, we were staging gliders there close to the paved runway. There's a berm uh, for takeoff to the south on 1-6. I was uh, briefing up my next student. I was next in line to tow. Uh, uh, one of the other club members there commented that uh, we had a glider in the pattern or glider on base. And I turned and looked, saw the, saw the airplane and said, well, yeah, he's a little low. And it looked to me at the first that he was uh, going wide on base to line up on the paved runway. The trees are a little bit lower with the paved runway. Um, I again turned my back to it and uh, was talking with my student when another guy commented, uh, he's low. And I don't know if he said, oh no, or he's low. And I turned and looked uh, just to see the glider come through the tops of the trees, uh, caught one tree a little bit heavier on one wing than the other, which spun him around and uh, nosed him down. So he actually, when he impacted, there's a slope there that leads down to the trees. He impacted on the top of that slope facing the opposite direction. Uh, went over there and I expected to find broken legs, broken feet because of the way it impacted uh, nose first. Uh, but uh, he was fine. Uh, another individual that had gotten to me, gotten there before I did, had moved the canopy out of the way and he was extricating himself out of the glider when I got there. So, no. and this is still preliminary. So when the NTSB uh, file comes out, there'll be better pictures that relate to Bill's observation. But here's a picture after the fact, uh, you know, of things kind of crunched up. You can see the nose crunched and everything that I had uh, taken of it. Just because the other photos are being used in the NTSB investigation right now, we'll, we'll wait and let those come out with the uh, NTSB docket. As I mentioned, most is still to be released, but this was something that um, Chief Pilot, Safety Officer, I had discussions, probably Dan, I think you did too, um, with them. And some things to really think about is currency and spring checkout, uh, how important it is to assure that the members in your club have the skill set to be able to operate the aircraft safely. Just because they did last season doesn't mean that they still have that same skill set. And one of the things that the club did, and after the fact considering, is they had made some adjustments to their currency policy associated with coronavirus, um, basically an assessment type program um, that maybe they wanted to work out better. Along the same lines, this aircraft is 
known for having very effective dive brakes. And, you know, it's one of the types that I've talked about is I go back to mentioning that focused tunnel vision is, you know, many times see people that are new to a glider getting themselves in a stressful situation, the tunnel vision, and they don't even realize that they still have dive brakes open or maybe have them open all of the way and ends up leaving them short or maybe even striking some odd objects. The next one in May, kind of getting into the busy season, was part 91 instructional in this Blanick. This is actually, believe it or not, a picture after uh, the accident is if you look closely, you'll be able to see some of the damage, but it was a hard landing. The FAA was on scene, no injuries. Student pilot, age 67, um, had been endorsed just nine days earlier uh, for solo operations, 21 hours total, all of it in the same make and model, three hours solo. This had been about a 1.5 hour flight. So about half of their solo time was on this one flight itself. And the flight was nothing unusual occurred. Coming back in for a landing, the pilot stated had a leg cramp in his right leg on final approach. Glider descended quicker than usual as the student pilot had the air brakes extended and landed hard after touchdown and then lost directional control, struck a runway light in a culvert. And this is the diagram here showing touchdown, then ended up swerving, coming through the right wing, hit this runway light. Uh, the right wing uh, hit in the culvert, came through, hit hard in relation and twisted around and left wing hit a taxiway light here and came to a stop. Results ended up being this buckled fuselage just half of the wing area, um, as you can see, and then damage to the wings that you see in this also. Probable cause, improper landing flare, which resulted in hard landing loss of control. Some takeaways, you know, you don't think about it, but all of us are at that point, we're getting a little bit more gray hair, we're having trouble keeping the hair, <laughs> whatever it may be. And in some of our documentation, and we've been debating this even internally within the FAA, and I, I've said, um, you know, my belief in relation to the update coming out on the glider flying handbook, but some people use the last E in the I'm safe as eating now, talking about food and water and hydration. And that is just so, so important um, in the glider community. I think we have found that and as we get a little bit more gray air, hair, not having uh, as much water and everything really does have an impact on our performance. And, even if you've ever dealt with a leg cramp, you, you probably understand some of what you have read here or seen here. Again, I'll stress just, you know, the spoilers being open. And one thing to think about, you know, you don't want to beat up on your gliders, but it may be something to practice with students from time to time. I, I know I do this and it surprises them. Granted, most of the teaching that I do is in a glider that has a skid on the nose, uh, which is a little bit better. There is a little bit of a um, skid bump on the Blanick L23s, but it's probably not as sturdy as the other types of gliders out there that have a full-blown metal or wooden skid. But you know, just practicing what I would call emergency braking or emergency stop, maximum effort stop, give consideration to that. Uh, because it is a skill set you are going to want to have if you do end up uh, landing off airport somewhere. And, you know, it really can help you stop before hitting something. Next one was back in the New England area, uh, Sanford, Maine. Uh, John Wood and I are pretty familiar with this one. Uh, the NTSB has it listed as a Part 91 personal flight. We do know that it was instructional with a brand new starting student um, with it, 233A. Really no injuries. The FAA did come out, take a look at the aircraft. 
It is labeled as a loss of control in flight. Uh, pilot had commercial CFI, also in airplanes, age 56. Flight review was just one month prior, 3,000 plus hours total. Great amount of those probably as an instructor, just knowing the person. 100 hours in make and model. This is one of the few accidents where weather may have been a contributing factor to it. The winds were listed as 260 at 12, gust to 17. They were operating off of the grass at a public airport adjacent to runway um, 25. And the instructor took over on final. The instructor is someone that I've personally flown with, very capable pilot, very capable instructor. I know when I got this call, you know, like a lot of these, it was a complete shock to me, like, you know, shaking your head, really? How, what, why? Uh, and I'm sure a lot of you go through that when things happen at, you know, your club or people that you know. The NTSB did not issue a docket on this one. Uh, so, you know, there's not a lot more, but thankfully, maybe, <laughs> John Wood and I know a lot about this, is basically what happened is a gust of wind displaced the glider laterally to the left. The pilot attempted to maneuver for a normal landing on the grass runway. However, the glider was too low to maneuver around a parked glider. And the glider ended up hitting the round ground looping and sustained substantial damage to the fuselage and wing. It, it basically landed sideways, pulling the area where the skid is located. If you look at the airport, this is the overall general view, but where they operate the gliders is from this grass area located between along the south side of runway 25 and 7. If I zoom it up, you can actually see this is where they park the gliders um, and will land down here. This area is where they usually stage and uh, take off. And if I remember correctly, John, correct me if I'm wrong, what had happened is they were turning on final, say about here, got hit with a gust of wind that blew them laterally sideways. So now they were over an area that had drainage ditch and also not shown in this picture, but gliders um, parked on the other side of this road in this area. And also someone seeing that they were lower, I guess had come to the conclusion that they were gonna touch down and stop beforehand, so they started pulling out a glider as all of this was happening, which set up the situation of the instructor having to get back over into the landing area and then get stopped as quick as possible. It was noted as the pilot's failure to maintain directional control while landing in gusty conditions. Uh, here's one of those things to think about uh, I know this has happened with accidents in the past, but what is the impact of having an accident? You know, it's not just the broken airframe and other things with it, but I believe this club is now disbanded, if I recall correctly. And I would not be surprised. I don't know wholeheartedly, but I'm sure it was probably something that was discussed among the board members within the club was the impact of this accident. It probably was a factor, um, you know, in deciding that, you know, maybe it is time for us to just close up shop. Uh, it was not a very old club, had only been in existence for about five years. And they had dealt with some other things. They lost a, the previous 233 to a windstorm. Uh, they also had had an, an incident at least with a student pilot uh, with yet another glider and so you know all of that are things that have an impact on your club and what impact can it maybe even have on the longevity of your club so that's definitely something to take away there you know always something to think about is alternate touchdown points um you know adjusting for if everybody comes home at once you know the competition pilots know this <laughs> you know whether it, it's a launch where the an overcast comes and everybody gets shut down and is landing at once, or it's an assigned area task. 
that everybody's right on target time and everybody trying to land at the same time. But uh, being able to adjust for that, whether it's lengthwise or sidestepping wise. And if you do operate in an airport, um, like many clubs do at public airports on the grass adjacent to the paved runway, you may have limited options on what you can do sidestepping, or even if you have a narrow runway, what is there? And one, this hit me after the fact, I know John and I had um, talked to the pilot and the club safety officer a bit after this, but the student in this case was a larger individual. The instructor is a smaller individual, you know, kind of weight height wise, the student was a little bit larger individual. And I do see this is something to think about is, as instructors is what you have for control effectiveness and use. And specifically in the 233s, I found it, I even find it myself when I'm up in the front of the 233 flying it. But if you're right back with a stick all the way back, trying to hold the wings level or at a minimum speed type of thing that sometimes you run out of, you know, full control deflection because the person's thigh or leg is there. In fact, you know, what I find to keep the wings level sometimes and landing in a crosswind in the 233, I actually end up, I can't even do it here on the camera, but let, let's say you got a crosswind from the left. So it'd be touching down and still having a little bit of right rudder but I'll then lift up my left leg in order to be able to tuck the stick underneath it in order to get full deflection uh, just because it's not available um, with how the setup design of the cockpit is. If you're a little bit larger person, you know, at someone my size, six foot two, you know, 210, 220 pound range, it can have an impact that you cannot especially when the stick is full aft, have that full control deflection. Did I hit on everything correct, John, on that? I, I was going off a of memory there. Anything to add? Yeah, you, no, you hit everything, Steve. You got everything that sounded great. Okay. Next one we had is, this will be a very serious one to give some thought to, is Wordsboro, New York in June, preliminary. It's a 135. Uh, on scene, uh, it appears that it's both the NTSB and the FAA. Um, that's from our FAA records are indicating that it was a fatal accident. One of our two fatals. The um, other one was associated with a motor glider. Private pilot, glider only, age 63. According to FAA records, has owned the aircraft for nearly 10 years. Um, what is to note, and this is available out there in the public records, uh, newspaper articles and stuff, is this pilot was in a previous accident uh, that we had taken a look at, also associated with um, tow launch. But according to the tow pilot, the accident pilot owned the glider and it was the first flight in the glider. I don't know if that was ever or just the season. That statement shows up in a few different places, including newspaper articles, but knowing that the pilot has been the owner of the aircraft uh, for 10 plus years, I, I have a hard time believing, I guess is the way to describe it, that it was their first flight ever in it. And in terms of owning that aircraft, I don't know if it was for personal use or if it was owned by the person, but loaned to the club. I, I just don't know how that all worked out there, but it was during initial climb for runway two, three, um, near the departure end at about 100 to 200 feet above ground level, so very low. The glider pilot released the tow rope and began a 45 degree bank turn back towards the airport. About 90 degrees through the turn, the nose dropped straight down. It was found that the tow release mechanisms function normally when tested and everything was in attached hardware was intact. And what I'm gonna do this is a little bit different, but because it was in my list of prior accidents to cover, I'm gonna jump into 
the update on the prior accident. This was the same pilot was involved in this accident in Wurtsboro in the Ventus 2A. The final to this accident was issued right after I had done this in the prior year. So I already had it pre-planned to cover it. Nothing majorly new here in terms of data, but what was happening, I'll just put this out there to read. I covered it last year. There's nothing new here. The red stuff, the red ink would indicate what was new, but the pilot did have um, a fairly low altitude release from tow associated with canopy being open, and window vent. This is what the aircraft looked like after the fact, you know, and some of the things to just point out, the takeaways that we covered here last year were training and prep on startle response, maybe even the effect of temperature, maybe even associated with fatigue, other things with it. The NTSB's probable cause on that Wordsboro accident, the first one, uh, failure to properly secure the glider's canopy before flight and the pilot's inability to maintain an appropriate final approach path, which resulted with impact in it. That's for the first one. The one involving the 135 has not been issued yet. But as I did mention, um, you know, this same pilot had a fatal glider tow accident in fiscal year 2021. And that just leads me to the question, given these circumstances with what we know so far, how close were we to one of these being a tow accident where it could have had an impact on the tow pilot also? I don't know if it was the same tow pilot um, on both of these flights. I, I just don't know that. But as a safety person, this is something that, you know, makes the antenna on top of my head <laughs> kind of stand up. And I, I wonder if, you know, out of sheer luck, we dodged a bullet uh, for the tow pilot on this. And that, that is definitely something to consider. Nellie's Ferd, Virginia, preliminary instructional, one serious, none. Uh, appears to be a hard landing with a back injury. We actually have a couple of these this year. What I'm going to put out is kind of a takeaway with this, and it had already crossed my mind as I've looked at <laughs> some gliders and the condition of their cushions and that sort of stuff. But, you know, think about the state of your club's glider cushions. Are they going to provide the impact resistance that you need? Is it time to replace, repair, or improve them? in your club. Willimantic, Connecticut happened here in New England, uh, preliminary part 91 instructional 126 E, uh, non-fatal injuries are listed as none. Um, seeing the pictures, I would ex expect a scrape or bump or bruise, but I really don't know. This is what it ended up looking like when it came to a stop. What happened is it was a student pilot ending up short of the runway and ended up putting it down in the median of Route 6 and slid and came to a stop right about where the X is in this diagram. I don't have much on the takeaways on this one, but what I do know is that it was a new airport to the club and the club was moving. I don't know if it was, you know, they had been there for a few weeks already if it, this was the first time they were operating there, but the club had recently moved from Danielson, Connecticut to Willimantic, uh, Connecticut. And Dan or Daryl might know a little bit more or have some takeaways associated with this. I, I, I don't know. Do you guys? Yeah, I've got some information on it, Steve. Um, uh, the reason they moved to the Willimantic, Connecticut airport was they were resurfacing the runway at Danielson. So we were either going to have to shut down the operation there uh, for a whole season or move to Willimantic. And this had been discussed, uh, I know, in the club uh, for quite some time, um, having a longer runway, having actually choice of two different runways, a north-south and an east-west runway. 
which meant that if we had some crosswind conditions, we might have been shut down at Danielson, but could still be operating out of Willimantic. So it made some sense about moving over there. Um, I, I know the pilot. Uh, this was his second or third year um, flying solo. Um, I noticed uh, in your um, first slide, it was a Part 91 instructional flight, but he was flying solo. I don't know if that has anything to do with the way you, uh, if flying solo is considered instructional or not, it's just a comment. Yeah, that's really dependent upon the NTSB investigator. On the um, Usually on a student solo, you will see it labeled as instructional, um, but sometimes you'll just see them labeled as personal, especially if it was someone adding a rating. But there's no rhyme or reason that I've seen so far. Well, I know this, this uh, person had flown this glider several times. I'm um, sure he's flown it more than once at the Willimantic Airport, too. Uh, coincidentally, I was doing an exam for a commercial airplane applicant, and I arrived at the airport probably about the time he was uh, putting it down on the road and running into the fence there. Um, we were getting set up for runway 36. That was the prevailing <laughs> runway. Um, we had a pretty good stiff wind from the north, I remember. And the applicant was, uh, you know, talking about this during the oral that, uh, you know, this might be a factor that he was going to be adjusting for. Um, I know that the uh, glider applicant or the glider student pilot was soloing south of the airport over a what was a house thermal, which was a, a sand pit. And um, I never really measured it, but I'm gonna say it's probably about two miles away. Um, and, uh, and I don't know much more than that. I didn't talk to the gentleman. Um, the only thing I heard was uh, he, he ran into a lot of sink and couldn't make it back to the airport. Um, but, you know, I was thinking, well, we had a good stiff wind from the north. Um, my thought was if this was my student I was letting solo, I wouldn't let him be that far south of the airport. And um, what was his minimum uh, thermaling height? At what point does he say, that's enough, I'm heading back to the airport? Um, and the, he did, Again, this is some of my conjecture here too, in my opinion. So that may be uh, not of it, none of its fact, but um, it appears that he flew over a uh, a golf course on the way to um, that final accident site too. Uh, again, um, I think some people think they need to get back to the airport, and um, when there are several. Uh, at least out here in the east, um, you know, we've got some nice um, hay fields. We've got a um, got a golf course, and coincidentally, there's a, a connector that's a highway that uh, usually doesn't have that much traffic on it, and um, probably could have landed on, on a highway as well. But um, yeah, I, I I think I would have uh, wondered what were the um, solo limitations there uh, that were on his endorsement. Uh, was he flying beyond them? And um, for all of these kind of accidents with a, a solo student, uh, the glider ops people, what, what were their responsibilities um, that might have averted this? Uh, people checking his endorsement for what are the limitations his flight instructor put in there? Uh, what's the club policy for uh, solo students? Do we have any, you know, wind or gust limitations? Um, so uh, I think it's your classic uh, landing short, and those are some of the uh, causal factors that lead up to it. Perfect. Thank you. Well, continuing on, out in Winthrop, Washington, we had this one, which is final, uh, injuries minor. No on-scene investigation by the FAA or the NTSB was a loss of lift. Commercial CFI airplane two flight review 13 months ago, 16 hours. Um, 145 hours in the make and model. Had purchased the aircraft just a little less than a year before on it. 
What is interesting, it, it's probably more so a typo, is both the NTSB and the FAA said it had had its last annual done around the time it purchased the aircraft and the aircraft had only flown 20 hours since then. However, you take a look at the pilot and the aircraft on OLC and you'll see many more hours than that. So I, I suspect that is really either just a typo or a misunder, misheard statement by the FAA or NTSB. There is no NTSB docket on this one too, which is something interesting that has occurred in this past fiscal year. We're seeing fewer NTSB dockets, which I'm hoping they will get added later on and that this is not becoming a trend because there's always very good, valuable information in the docket. Was unable to maintain altitude, performing off airport landing in a valley clearing. Uh, on the landing roll, ultimately the right wing was damaged when it struck a tree. Is as reported in the FAA, pilot described setting up to descend into a field with full flaps and spoilers. It was doing full braking on the ground, but could not come to a full stop before the end of the meadow with several trees in its path. So the PIC elected to, and that was, you know, kind of set it up so that the right wing um, struck the tree. Basically what I'm getting at is sounding like the pilot was doing the best or the right thing that they could, which is, one of the things that we end up learning from a lot of these accidents. Um, you know, the gliders encounter with atmospheric conditions insufficient to maintain lift. I talked about the damage described, the right wing going into a tree, the aircraft then spinning and the left wing striking uh, the ground and the tail boom breaking. We talked about emergency stopping. We've talked a bit about off field landings um really can't emphasize it enough is some of the things we probably need to emphasize this more is what i would get at on the takeaway some of the good things about this if you dig in deeper on this one uh it does the pilot talks about emergency fields and what the cross-country plan was for the day and that this was something that was taken into account ahead of time uh, some of the fields, like Bill has mentioned, is, you know, the sneakers were put on them, so you know what they were like. And this is also one of those areas I mentioned with route planning, where things like the OLC and We Glide can help you understand what are maybe some of the common routes, uh, be, not only with a lift, but also with what may be available for um, land out or emergency fields that may be available there. Wellington, Colorado, I'm going to go through these last few quick uh, here just to get us finished up, but loss of visual reference, non-fatal, it is final, 135. This is a picture of the aircraft with a prior owner, private, age 69, flight review, 19 months, 250. First flight at this airport, that's probably the big thing. And then you kind of lost sight of visual references, see the 10 miles and clear, make you go, huh? And that's what I did when I first heard about this and then saw the weather. But glider pilot reported during the base leg to final for landing, lost sight of the runway, maneuvered to avoid a house and performed an off-field landing on rough sloping terrain, reported first landing at the airport, really should have flown an orientation flight with another pilot familiar with the airport. Terrific idea. Um, you know, it would put emphasis there. This is what it looked like after some bent metal, which is not good. But if you take a look at it, even on Google Earth at the airport, uh, you kind of understand it. I believe by the description that this is the house and then the area out here where the pilot ultimately ended up landing out. And just by this you know, overview, you can already see, given the terrain around it, how difficult it might be. And if it was your first time there, you know, stress getting to you, that sort of thing, I can start to understand how losing sight of the airport um, may have come up. Probable cause, you know, pretty much straightforward. 
orientation flight, we mentioned it really is worth it. If you're not a very active GA pilot or you're dealing with significant differences in terrain conditions, the club excursions, mentioned that. And then also I got to emphasize, it's the folks out West that have been dealing with this for a few years now. But when we talk about limited visual reference, I, you have to emphasize is things can change when you're cross country flying and especially with the smoke and fires out there, you know, it might not be a factor <laughs> at the start of the flight, but it might be later on in the flight. And that's something I'm sure that you need to be giving consideration to. And that's where I would, you know, look for guidance from people that know the area well and what's happening with the current conditions. Sterling mass, we have this preliminary one, loss of directional control on takeoff. It was a ground loop ultimately with a broken boom, long grass. It actually was the pilot's second ground loop uh, about one hour prior had ground looped and released uh, basically in time and that the pilot took a break to think and kind of review over it. The one thing I would add is it would be helpful in those circumstances um, because the pilot specifically mentions that maybe their aeronautical decision-making was off. And this is information that was shared with the FAA in an open format with the uh, pilot in the club maybe the aeronautical decision-making was off, but to get other resources, other pilots involved in that. And this is one of the challenges, the club had talked to me about this, is due to various reasons, um, the upkeep of the airport had become a bit of a challenge. It was a private airport open to the public, but due to life circumstances, the private owner was unable to upkeep the airport and the mowing and the grass and all of that as well as they had in the past. So the club was trying to do the upkeep as best as they could, but you know, it's a challenge with any club is the volunteers who's going to do what. And then correspondingly, you end up with, you know, just certain individuals that do a large majority of the work. And, you know, this is might end up being an example accident that, this in terms of the club culture and what we all deal with in clubs could end up have been a contributing factor uh, to this accident. You know, and correspondingly, as I talk about a little bit with the CRM, what do you do when things go wrong? You know, again, this is challenges in clubs and on weekends. Um, you know, it's correct to take a break but how do you improve your theory of the situation? Also, you know, it was discussed a pressure to keep the ops tempo going because you only have so many good weekends and, you know, you only have tow pilots available at certain times. So, you know, that were factors. And I had mentioned earlier, just wing runners and the impact on that. I don't know if it was a factor here or not, but seeing the ground loop, it at least brings that up to me. Again, I said, I'm going through these fairly quick. We're right getting close to the end. This is an accident for instructors. I would recommend that you get into and uh, take a look for yourselves. Uh, there's some great information for instructors on the docket here. It's final, non-fatal injuries, if anything, were minor. It was a commercial CFI, also for airplane student glider, 6152. Flight review was recent, fair amount of time. Instructor had been working with students in the morning, but excellent soaring forecast. So the plan was, hey, let's get something to eat, plan a longer flight, stretch our soaring legs with a student. And that's what they were working on. And viable plan, it sounds like. But what happened is they encountered insufficient lift and decided to land off airport. However, during the landing roll, the glider collided with barbed wire fence. And this is one of those things I didn't know until the final came out myself, because uh, I didn't see it in the FAA data. But I knew about the damage to the right wing and stuff. They landed on a beach near Yuba Lake State Park. And this is what the right wing looked like. But this, I mean, I, I 
sure I gasped uh, when I saw this next picture looking at the NTSB data when it finally hit me what it was, is I'm looking at this and I'm looking at the rear canopy and going, wow, I can see how it might compress and break. And then I'm looking, and then I noticed the line, you know, um, right down here in the canopy. And I realized that was cut by wire. Uh, what happened is the barbed wire fence came up and over the nose and then ultimately cut down through, broke the canopy and cut through it right in the, um, right in front of the face of the instructor. And all I got to say is, you know, lucky instructor, you can see the fence line in the background of this. And I would encourage, you know, instructors to kind of save this picture uh, in their thing. What's great, this one's going to be pretty straightforward and simple for instructors. The club and instructors did a terrific job of recommendations to avoid this in the future and how to avoid this accident and how to prepare yourself for these dangers. So I would encourage the instructors to go look at the memo for record and memo for recommendations on this. And, you know, maybe something for all of you to discuss uh, between yourselves. This is the big maintenance accident um, for the year. The private pilot, airplane, single engine, land and glider, H-79, flight review, three months, 2,800, 1,600. The aircraft had had an annual just three weeks prior and tow plane about 300, the glider unexpectedly released. Uh, the tail boom and empennage separated during the landing. Tow rope appeared undamaged. Examination of the glider reverted. The vertical elevator rod had a fracture. We'll take a look at those. And vertical elevator control rod exhibited significant corrosion. This is what the glider looked like after it came to a stop. Of course, it hit hard. Um, you know, that's what injured the pilot slid to a stop here in these circumstances. And you start looking at the elevator control rod. There we go. A little slow in reacting to my clicking, but <clears throat> you can see break and what it looks like corrosion here. The break in the elevator control rod at one end here. And then you can also see in this picture right in here where it had corroded out and had an open hole in it. Already some countries have used this as a factor in declaring an airworthiness directive for almost identical types of airframes. Um, there is an AD already issued for this issue uh, on them for the 304 C's and CZ's. This technically was an S version, which just means it has an engine bay in it, um, which we don't, to the best of my knowledge, we don't have any of those here in the United States in a standard category. All the ones I'm familiar with are experimental, and that may be a factor why we have not seen a AD issued almost immediately on this type of accident. But other countries that do have it as standard don't allow experimental exhibition air racing or things like that uh, already have adopted airworthiness directives in relation to it. So what that brings up is, you know, gonna be thinking about the quality of your annual and condition inspections. And I gotta emphasize here, this is something that you don't hear a lot about, but I think it's absolutely terrific is boroscopes uh, in glider maintenance. Is They're very inexpensive now. They're terrific. You can check so many things on so many different aircraft. And if you wanna take a look at some interesting maintenance things and also see how a boroscope can see them and find them for you in an inspection, uh, this is a um, Brit, person that does inspections uh, and maintenance on gliders, but you can find him on YouTube if you just, on the YouTube search, do Gordon McDonald glider, and he has a few short videos. They're mostly just videos of examples of 
issues or problems that he has found as a glider maintenance inspector in Great Britain. Um, but it is a terrific example of how a boroscope can help you. Sterling Mass was the third accident that we had in Massachusetts. This one was instructional. It is final. Serious injuries um, for the instructor. The FA was on scene. It's listed as aerodynamic stall, but hard landing. Pretty much nothing that came out significantly, you know, time-wise, all of that. The instructor was in the rear seat. The aircraft did have uh, minimal damage, you know, strut seals, problems with the landing gear strut. I don't know. I've heard both just the strut seals. I've heard that the entire landing gear strut had to be replaced. I don't recall on that. Bill, do you remember? Was it just the seals or the whole strut? Well, the strut essentially collapsed. And yeah. so, yeah, the seals are blown out. So you have to basically replace that with another strut or rebuild the strut. Luckily, uh, we had a second one on the shelf and we sent that one back off to Atlantic for repair. Yeah. So yeah, the seals, it, the, the strut collapsed all the way down hard to the ground. He, he hit it that hard. Yeah. And, and this is one of those that does happen sometimes after the fact, something you realize is an accident. And that's why it's, the instructor had back pain and had trouble getting out of the glider and that sort of stuff after it, but went home trying to relax. And then subsequently, you know, to such an extent went to the local emergency room and ended up finding out that they had a broken vertebra, vertebrae, however you want to pronounce it. So some things to think about as instructors is what is your hand position in relation to the controls with a student? You know, we noted the cushions easily. I think uh, this club is redoing it. I don't know, but someone had mentioned this to me about this accident and also the other one where the instructor had a back injury. Uh, I think that was down in Virginia, if I recall correctly. Is there a difference between pavement and grass in the impact on this? And I really don't know the answer to that, but I at least put it out there as something to discuss. This landing was on grass. Was it on grass? Yeah. Then one of the last glider ones that we had was Civil Air Patrol. Did not look like this. This is the airframe, but it had been repainted uh, since this picture was taken. Instructional. Uh, no injuries. Commercial CFI, multiple types of aircraft. I don't know if the student was commercial or CFI. That information is not listed uh, on the second pilot but I would suspect because this was in prep for a CAP orientation flight camp, that the person was at least a commercial glider pilot, if not a commercial in CFI. Yeah. What is interesting to note, uh, this is a challenge and I know other clubs have dealt with this. This aircraft had just completed a complete refurb at K&L uh, soaring in the prior year. So a fair amount of money had been spent on it, but ended up short of the runway. I had just missed this accident by about 10 minutes. I had just left the airport. Uh, I arrived the next morning. I had pilots at the airport asking me if I was there for the investigation, which it's kind of like, oh no, what happened? Uh, type of thing. But this is the airport where they operate out of. This is another one of those public airports where they operate on the flat or grass side strip. And they had gone out, done a simulated rope break and ended up not being able to return back to the airport. Here's damage of the glider that I had taken that next morning. Uh, it was already put on the trailer. It was also a little bit of damage to the fuselage. Some of the things to be thinking about is put, uh, you know, premature termination of tow training. Don't make it worse. <laughs> yeah, it, it's always most important to fly the aircraft. It is probably the most common reason for instructor 709s. And also think about advanced CFI training or advanced training. How is it different? You know, you're working with teaching risk management, but you also have to manage the risk with it and the risk of teaching transition pilots, especially higher time transition pilots. And I just note, this is what happens 
in some circumstances. And I know with a lot of the training for their members that the CAP um, works with is dealing with. And that's completely different. You know, working with someone that's been flying for 30 years, say professionally in jets to working with someone, you know, that's 17, 18 years old and wants to just learn to fly. So finishing up here, you've heard me say this before, I'll say it again. Safety is more than just not having an accident and you gotta think about the risks that you take out there. You know, sometimes people do things because they think it's neat, <laughs> but you also have to wonder about, you know, what could happen or what would happen. Uh, this picture always has scared me every time I've seen it. You know, also think about the Soaring Safety Foundation has their actions and recommendations. They'll be coming out soon. Uh, with an update to this, but this is from their 2020 timeframe. And then what we've seen, takeaways, safety points today, just talking about solo student stress, tunnel vision, scene avoid limitations, bailout procedures, collision avoidance, low and flat approaches, outlanding, boarded launches and training, crew coordination with ground crew ops, spring checkouts, flight reviews, what's the difference between being proficient and current, I'm safe, emergency max braking, alternate touchdown, fouled runway, passenger interference with the controls, ready, being ready for the tow or the launch, cushions, seats and seat belts, what condition are they in, in your club? Think about it, flying at new airports, what are the benefits to be gained? What are the hazards and the risks to think about? Maintenance and inspection came up here with gliders. Come back for part three. <laughs> it's gonna come back again uh, with it. Instructor covering controls and premature termination of tow training along with advanced training. So, you know, a lot of highlight points, a lot of things to kind of take away and discuss in your club with the other instructors. Do want to thank you for hanging out and even for this extra time here just to help us get through all of it. All of this is available for you. Uh, we're going to do tow planes and review of accidents next Monday night. I hope to see you there. We've had nearly 400 of you on tonight and do want to thank you for joining us and hope to see you again soon.